Uh, this is on integrated photonics. No, I'm not just joking. I mean, it's the most important. <laughs> it's integrated photonics, new technology focus. We have uh, four speakers today. Uh, the first one, it's uh, the silicon modulators. This is Max Zender modulators. Uh, Graham Reed will be giving the history and future of uh, Max Zender modulators. So Dr. Professor Reed is a pioneer in the field of silicon photonics. Uh, he established the Silicon Photonics Research Group in UK in 1989. Uh, the group have provided a series of world-leading results since its inception and are particularly well known for their work on silicon optical modulators. Uh, Reed is currently a member of six international conferences, conference committees, and has published over 350 papers in the field of silicon photonics. Uh, in 2013, he was the recipient of the IET Crompton Medal for Achievement in Energy for his work on silicon photonics. Uh, and in 2014, he was awarded a Royal Society Wolfson Merit Award. Uh, let's welcome Professor Reed. So thank you, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation to be back again. Um, those of you who were here last year may recall that I was asked to speak about European funding a few days after the Brexit vote. <laughs> and I noticed this year you've invited me to speak on the day that Britain has initiated its... Uh, so I don't quite know what's going on, but maybe something. OK, anyway, let's get on with it, shall we? Right. So Kim asked me to speak on uh, Max Zender modulators, which is a little bit closer to home than last year. And I took this as an opportunity to maybe talk about some of our own work. Uh, so it's a little bit of self-indulgent, perhaps, but uh, I can trot through some of um, our early work, if that's OK. So. Obviously, there's a huge amount of work in, uh, in, in optical modulators in silicon, and there are a variety of approaches. Um, what we've done at Southampton is tend to focus on the uh, free carrier effect. I will talk a, very briefly about um, silicon germanium electroabsorption modulators at the end as well. Um, so. I'm sure I don't need to remind you of uh, the fact that um, the change um, in index that we derive from electrons and holes is uh, captured for one wavelength in this, um, this equation from Richard Soroff. And it sort of um, enables you to think about three primary ways of implementing modulators. Um, in our early days, we worked on carrier um, injection, and I'll just remind you of a couple of those things in a minute. The majority of our work has been on carrier depletion, and we've done a little bit of work on accumulation, but not a huge amount. So it may um, surprise you to know that we were making modulators as long ago as, well, actually earlier than 93. That was just that, we, that was the first publication. This was my second ever student, a guy called Jeremy Tang, after Andrew Rickman was the first. Um, and even in those early days, we were trying to uh, improve uh, efficiency and reduce power and so on. Uh, but you can see we were working in fairly large wave guys, six and a half microns, and that's why it was carrier injection, because we weren't really worried about uh, uh, speed in those days. We were thinking more sensor interrogation. And it's interesting now that we're coming back to that again, um, but in somewhat smaller waveguides in general. Uh, we carried on with injection for a while. Um, we did start to reduce the device dimensions to improve the speed. So this was still an injection design. And you see that there are three terminals on this device. Um, and actually, in the paper that was published in 2004, we did actually think about um, uh, pre-emphasis as well, um, a little bit before Mikhail Lipschin actually did it. But we didn't actually do it because we, th we thought we ought to perhaps concentrate more on the depletion devices um, 
to improve the speed significantly because by now it was obvious that uh, the, um, the telecom applications were uh, requiring more attention. So in 2005, we started working more on the depletion devices. So this was um, some work published uh, by, I think Fred Gards was still my student at that time. Um, and I believe this was the first paper to, uh, to publish this idea. But because we didn't have our own fab in those days, we didn't make it for a few years later. I think it's interesting just to see the trend here from the large waveguides um, driven predominantly by speed to get the modulators to be much qu quicker because we're physically moving charges around and so uh, uh, size is important, as they say. Um, so you see one implementation of a, a depletion device here in this slide and you see it's sort of offset deliberately and I'll, I'll perhaps show you why that is um, here. So it's sort of an, an, uh, intuitively natural to try and put the junction in the middle or somewhere near the middle, I guess. Um, and what you see is if you look at the effective index with uh, the tolerance of that positioning, then once you accumulate the, the error in the effective index over the length of a device, you can end up with a significant error. So and obviously it depends which lithography node you're using as to how accurately you can position that, uh, uh, that junction. So one of the um, things we did was to try and think about the manufacturability of that structure. And so we produced a self-aligned design, um, which is shown here. So you simply use the same mask as you use to etch the waveguide to implement the junction. And obviously, if, this, if you do it like this, you get the junction right at the edge of that uh, waveguide. But you can also do an angled implant here to push the junction into the, um, the waveguide as well. And so obviously, the point here is that it's the same every time. It's not reliant on that, uh, that tolerance. So um, this was uh, implemented in, in various of our devices. This particular one happens to be in a European project called Helios, which I think Mike Schmidt mentioned earlier as part of the um, uh, development of, uh, of the European platforms. And in this device, um, we produced a range of, uh, of designs. And as you know, you can trade off the performance of uh, silicon modulators. So for example, a three and a half millimeter, these are all single-ended. This is actually the original data from those uh, devices. So a three and a half millimeter versus a one millimeter length device, you can trade off um, perhaps extinction ratio if you drive at the same voltage or you can drive at different voltages and, and get a different extinction and so on and so forth. Um, and so you see that by about 2011, we were getting 40 gigabits and then a the year later, 50 gigabit per second. Um, and so I, have, I sort of think that perhaps universities shouldn't be doing what industry does for the most part, unless of course we're working with a particular collaborator on something. So around about this time, um, once these, these speeds, you know, we're reaching speeds that are sort of uh, acceptable for a variety of um, applications, at least at this point, we started to turn our attention to um, the drivers a little bit more. Oh, actually, I should say, yeah, I forgot to mention this slide. So if, if I take you back a slide, so take this example. So 40 gigs, 3.5 dBs, high drive voltage, but that was the first device, as I mentioned. But it's a single-ended device, so we're only driving one arm of the Max Ender. What it doesn't say on this slide is that the insertion loss of that device was 15 dBs in those days. Um, and so now, you know, there are a whole host of uh, various designs and iterations, but 
we obviously need to be worth thinking about working at 1300 as well as 1550. And you can see it's just one example of where you get sort of similar performance, but now the insertion loss is only looking like something around about 3 dBs or less in this particular case. And obviously, again, that's a trade-off with insertion loss length, you know, all, all the usual parameters. Um, but because we can optimize things so much more readily these days, we can obviously get better performance. And this just really shows that you design your, your modulator for a particular application. So, um, also within that Helios program, um, there was a bit of technology transfer required. So, in those days, the, uh, we were using the foundries a little bit more. So, the first device was fabricated at uh, CA Letty in France. And then we transferred that device across to IHP in Germany. Uh, and they have, and, and this is um, uh, an example of, uh, of the device in their technology. And they have a, um, a by CMOS process. And so this was the first um, modulator that came out of that process. And it's an interesting process. Um, so they take an SOI wafer. And if you can look, I'll, I'll show you, start with this diagram. So what you see here is um, the SIGI devices here, the SOI here. So what has happened is that they have removed the oxide in this region and regrown it. And that's why you see this, um, this overlay growth here. And then CMP'd it to give you a bulk region for the electronics and an SOI region for um, the photonics. And that was, um, that was, as I say, in that program. So it was circa 2012-13, but finally published in 2014. And um, there's the performance of that all integrated device. And interestingly, so remember that was a, a 40 or 50 gigabit per second modulator. And so this was limited really by the performance of the electronics and to, to a certain extent the integration, but it was the first device. Um, so we've done a variety of pieces of work on integration. But as I said, we started to turn our attention to the drivers. And here's, here's just one example of uh, one from a few years ago. And so this, this was made at TSMC in the 65 nanometer node. I'll explain why that is in a minute. And so this is showing you, um, again, various different uh, implementations at uh, different voltages, different uh, designs, and so on. Oh, actually, what I should just point out is now, as I said, the reason we turned our attention to the drivers is because obviously we're interested in the power. I think the battery is starting to go on. So you can see that this, this is significant um, power required here. So this is sort of uh, circa 10 picojoules per bit if you take that power at that point. Um, more examples, so at Southampton we can, we have wire bonding and we have flip chip. Uh, and to a certain extent, some of the performance is limited in these earlier ones by the wire bonding. Um, this is the optical out of those particular uh, designs. But again, you see sort of acceptable performance, 30 gigabit per second, you know, 4 dBs extinction, and so on and so forth. So now this is the slide I, was in, I wanted to show you. So um, this shows that when we, when we first turned our attention to um, trying to do the drivers, we started off um, in this large technology node, largely because of the cost. So you know, cost to a university. Uh, is significant, and I obviously wanted to to get our guys to develop their their skills before we leapt into say 28 nanometers, which you know again for a university is pretty expensive. Um, and so that 65 nanometer um, uh, structure I showed you was this one here at about 10 picojoules per bit. 
So we had a revised um, design in the 40 nanometer node and got it down to 6.6. .6. And we have just received relatively recently our 28 nanometer design. Now, unfortunately, the flip chip bond is down. Uh, so we had to wire bond this. So what we did was, was not wire bond it to one of the better modulators. Um, and what you see is the performance is about 33 milliwatts at only 22 gigabit per second. Um, now, and that's partly the modulator design and it's partly the wire bonding. Uh, but still, that's you know, about one and a half picojoules per bit. But the drivers actually operate at 40 gigabit per second and beyond. And so what that tells you is um, that you know, this sort of power level and those faster modulators, you know, obviously it doesn't just scale by the data rate because the, the power will increase. But that projects to something um, below a picojoule per bit. Um, I've put 0.8 here, but you know, who knows, maybe less. So, I, so despite the fact that we couldn't do what we wanted to do with this first um, with these first drivers we've got back. I wanted to do something until the, the tool's fixed. And so I think this is an encouraging result because um, we ought to be substantially below a picojoule per bit, I hope, based on that technology. And so at least I have uh, something to show you based on that. Uh, OK. So now here's the bit where, um, you know, I kind of resisted um, just simply getting into uh, different modulation schemes and so on, because obviously industry is doing all of that stuff. Um, but sometimes you get dragged in, and sometimes you just have to take the money. Um, so, but we haven't done a huge amount, and, we, and, and I only put it up to show that um, we have a little bit of capability in the area. So, the the obvious. Uh, opportunities exist. What we've done most is PAM4 because it's not so different from the drivers we already uh, design. And we've done a little bit of DMT. And so just so that there are some slides here, what I have included is a few slides. I don't need to go through this now because uh, it was put up earlier today, pretty much. Um, the, uh, the setup for DMT and the corresponding PAM4 setup. And, and of course, as you would expect, you do a bit better in DMT. But at these data rates, and by the way, we're limited by our DMT equipment. Um, so we use the same equipment for both rather than using our own drivers for this particular comparison. Uh, and um, as I say, the, uh, the conclusion is somewhat what you would expect that you do better in DMT, but it's more complex. And it's a little bit less familiar to us than, um, than working in PAM4, which is sort of closer to where our uh, more conventional skill set lives. Although the, uh, that's obviously growing. OK, so um, we also have dipped our toe, again, somewhat reluctantly into the um, into the coherent pond. And so I've just got this one slide, again, really to demonstrate that uh, we can do some of this stuff, um, you know, if you really twist our arm. Uh, and so this is some recent work uh, in collaboration with Peking University. Um, again, not the, not the most optimized of our um, modulated devices because we sort of get pulled in all directions. So. When we, when we had a fab run going, we just put uh, this design on the, um, on the mask. So I'm not going to really say much more than that. Kim asked me if we were going to include um, uh, phase as well as amplitude in the, in the discussion, but I sort of deliberately didn't answer that because I wasn't really sure what to put in. But anyway, there we are. So now getting on to... Um, things going forward. What I, this, so this is an example of something I think universities should do. It's something a bit different. Now, I put up this slide at this meeting two years ago to talk about erasable gratings for wafer scale testing. I'm not going to talk about that today, because this is supposed to be about modulators. 
But what I want to say is that these were fabricated by iron implantation of germanium to amorphize the structure in a periodic manner to form the grating. So what we've done is applied that uh, technology elsewhere. And, and so several people today have mentioned the issues surrounding, say, ring resonators. And so the link here is, in this talk, you know, maybe think about ring resonator modulators and how to reduce the power consumption. So this is a paper, um, as you see, not one of ours, which cites the, um, the errors that you can get uh, associated, in this case, with the fabrication of a ring. And so you see, you know, roughly speaking, it's about a nanometer per nanometer error. And that might be in thickness, width, or etch depth, let's say. So you can see, even with the best lithography, you're going to have an error of some description surrounding your ring. So what we've tried to do is apply the, um, the technology to rings, well, actually, and to Max Enders. I'll show you that in a second. So consider a ring. That's what you want. And you've got a target resonance wavelength. And what you get is this. And as we've seen already today from multiple speakers, what you do is typically put a heater on there. And you tune it onto resonance like that. And then you, then you track it and keep it there. Now, I can't do anything about the thermal drift with the technology I'm about to show you. But what I can do is take out this error to take off the amount of power that you use to offset the fabrication error. So, and therefore that offset power. And actually, you can do the same thing with a Max Zender, because if you make a, um, a balanced Max Zender, then again, those same errors will cause a phase error and therefore an imbalance in, um, in the Max Zender. And so, of course, what happens is that because the devices are relatively inefficient and they end up being quite long, that phase error accumulates even on a Max Zender, which is nominally athermal. Um, so again, if we can take that error out, then it still may be athermal. And so most people who make Max Zenders also put an extra little, um, if you like, slow modulator here to bias the modulator or to balance up the phase errors. And again, that's, um, that's more power. So what we've done to demonstrate this is to take a ring resonator and use that germanium implantation that we used in the gratings to cause damage in a part of the ring. So you implant a small part of that ring. And so it's shown a little bit bigger here. You probably can't quite see, but there are little tapers on either end of this to avoid the reflections that you might generate from a, um, a refractive index change at the, uh, either end. And for the purposes of defining it, we've defined it by arc length theta. Um, so here you see um, before and after annealing figures of a variety of arc lengths, you know, in other words, implanted lengths. So, you know, point two, uh, sorry, two, six, 14, and so on. And obviously, you can implant as, as long a length as you like. What you also see on this slide is annealing data. Now, this annealing was done in an RTA, but actually, you wouldn't do it in an RTA. But we've done it in an RTA to try and identify the temperature accurately. What you would actually do is anneal it with a laser, which is what we do with the gratings. Um, but what we wanted to establish was how well we can control the shift in the resonances with temperature. Uh, but you know, before we get to that, what you see here are just different lengths of implanted um, ring shifting you know, the resonance, as you would expect, by a certain, oh gosh, by a certain amount. Um, and that's just summarizing that data. And what you see here is that if we anneal at different temperatures, we can control the amount of shift. In other words, we're recrystallizing the damage in the silicon with temperature. 
And so we can pull the ring back to its resonant wavelength by controlling that uh, temperature and or controlling the length that we implant. Okay, so I'm getting told I'm running out of time, so I want to leave you with one other thing. So back to more conventional um, or recognizable structures. So um, if anyone was at OFC, they may have seen that um, iMac had a 100 gigabit per second EAM device. Um, so I just want to talk briefly about that. So we have an EAM device that has uh, a data rate greater than 56 gigabit per second, but we don't know how big because we can't measure any faster than that. So if anyone can help us, we'd be grateful. Um, so this, for all I know, may also be 100 gig. But anyway, um, this is uh, work that Fred Garz is leading at Southampton. That's his email address, and this was presented first at, uh, at Photonics West this year. Now, that's interesting in itself, but the issue with... Um, absorption EAMs usually is that they're very narrow band because they're associated with the band gap. So if you grow silicon germanium on the wafer, you've only got one silicon germanium concentration, therefore you've only got one wavelength. But what Fred's been doing is developing a process called rapid melt growth where you deposit amorphous germanium and you use a silicon seed from your SOI to regrow the structure. Now, people have looked at this for many years, and what normally happens is because the point at which the silicon germanium solidifies is dependent upon the growth rate and the thermal um, nature of the regrowth process, is that you end up with a graded line of silicon germanium concentration. And this is well known, and here's a, a model that maps it along this graph here. So actually, this isn't much use for a silicon germanium uh, modulator. So what you would really like is a fixed um, concentration along your growth line like this. So that would represent a flat uh, on this curve. Um, and so obviously I wouldn't have said that if Fred hadn't found a way of doing it. And so what he does is adds these branches to this central piece and these branches enable you to control the rate of cooling. And you still get the graded lines in, the, in these fins, but you get a fixed concentration in the central piece. So now you can put down low-cost amorphous germanium um, and uh, regrow it. But that's not the end of the story, because even if you could do that, there would still only be one concentration on the chips. So it wouldn't be any better than growing it normally. So what he then did was take that graded line and tap off at different points along that line. And then add the fins, and lo and behold, you get different fixed concentrations along that line. So now you can have multiple silicon germanium concentrations on the same wafer, on the same chip. And not only that, at the end of the line, you'll have 100% germanium, so you can have a detector as well. Now, we haven't got that far yet, um, but all the indications are this is, well, these rather are very high quality germanium. And so this looks like um, a way to make these devices different wavelengths for WDM on the same chip. And as you know, EAMs are very low energy. Uh, and that first device I showed you I'll just skip back to it briefly. It's about femto, uh, 50 femtojoules per bit for the, just the device without the driver. Uh, and so potentially now we can have uh, lots of very low energy devices on that same chip, multiplex together, detectors and so on. So as I'm out of time, I won't read this out to you. That, this summary just says what I've just said. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll stop there. I'll thank my group. Uh, thank you, Professor Reed. Uh, maybe we can ask one quick question. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, I have a question with the, uh, the driver uh, roadmap trend that you described. So I with, think you've uh, got out, Yeah, turn it on. So a question about the, the uh, CMOS driver trend that you showed us. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I know the logic that you scale to higher speed and to smaller node, you have 
a higher bandwidth and the lower power, power consumption, but won't it be even lower driving voltage along the line? So at the end of the day, if you scale to lower, it's a sub one, sub one volt. Yeah, so, okay, so the question is, as you go to, lower, uh, to smaller technology node, you run out of voltage. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think our drive, I mean, this is why we design our own drivers. We can mm -hmm. improve the voltage, uh, and we can remove the need for certain biases and so on. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a, um, an undisclosed design, <laughs> shall we say. Okay. So, um, I mean, it's not limitless, but, you know, given the sorts of devices we have, it's certainly drivable. I mean, the, you saw the, the last piece of data. It was driving a, a, a modulator in the same way as we would drive a conventional silicon modulator, and the speed was only limited by that particular modulator design. Because mm -hmm. we've, you know, we've got relatively few um, of the high-speed devices currently available because, the, you know, the latest fab run, they've all been used. So I didn't want to just bond one of the, um, the high-speed devices when we're running out of them, not knowing if the drivers work particularly well. Mm -hmm. That's all. So when the when the flip chip bond is available, we will be able to drive the high speed devices, and, and I'm yeah, you know, I'm expecting this part. will be very but good. With, I mean, with lower driving voltage, you have to design the modulator longer or treat out some some other properties to yeah, but, make it work. But we're you're not you're not limited in, as you're not limited quite in the way you think. You okay. can enhance the voltage a bit. Okay, thank you. Okay, <coughs> okay. Let's thank Professor Reed once again. Thank you.